Well, first of all, it is so good to be back. It is so good. And for some of you, if you haven't been here for a while, this wonderful congregation gifted me with a 30-day sabbatical, and I timed it, Michael and I both did, because we both work for churches, that we would only be gone three Sundays instead of four, but literally, I had 30 days. And you'll hear this in just a minute. Matter of fact, I think I'll bring it up right now. But I want to tell you that I am so grateful because uh, there's no way to describe what this job is like. And to be able to shut it 90%, 95% off is a, is a miracle. But it takes having the right people on the right bus at the right time. And this church didn't skip a beat. You have powerful speakers. I've listened to every one of them while I was away. And they did an amazing job. I'm like, mm, if something happened to me tomorrow, you all be in good shape. You really would. And that's a good feeling. That is a good feeling for me. So I want you to know that. But I want to talk to you about the biggest elephant in the room, and that's what's going on in Ukraine. I cannot not talk about it. I can't be here and just give you some blase message, inspirational message, without talking about the elephant in the room. So I want to just tell you, because this is true for me. At Urban Bible Church in suburban Kiev, the minister quickly decided to change his message that he had prepared to talk on marriage. And instead, he focused, his focus turned to prayer for wisdom, prayer for courage, prayer for ministers in the occupied territories, the National Army, and even the enemies of Ukraine. And that's how I feel this morning. I had a totally different talk figured out, and last night I said, I can do part of that but I want to talk about this. I want, to, I want to just give you some excerpts. Ukrainian evangelicals were preaching peace the day before the invasion started. And I just want to give you some short little excerpt lines that various ministers throughout Ukraine we're sharing with our congregations. We are not only to enjoy peace ourselves, but to share it. That's one minister to their congregation. Another minister to their congregation. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Another one. But I know for sure that if you open your heart to the Lord... Now, you know, for me, when I see Lord, I say oneness consciousness. So for me, when I open my heart to the Lord, to the open to the oneness consciousness that I know that is, you will come out renewed, strengthened in Jesus, and ready for anything that is challenging your life. And the last one that I have that I've, I've chosen to share with you was, should there be chaos and confusion, the churches can be lighthouses in their community. I'll say that one again because that ended up in meditation, didn't it? I think it did. I don't write my meditation, so I think I've talked about a lighthouse. I'm going to read that again. Should there be chaos and confusion, the church can be the lighthouse in the community. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know that that creator watches me, and as Marcy said, and you. I was searching last, late last night, and I found this following dialogue of a retelling of an, an emergency global prayer meeting that was held in or held by Lausanne 
Europe on Thursday, February 24th. A Ukrainian woman, her name is Angela. She says, well, it's, it's rather long, so I'm just going to give you some excerpts out of her talk. But she ta she's on the line, the prayer line call, and it's global. And she says, I, struggled, I have struggled to make it through this day. In the afternoon, I decided that I was going to in, in join in on this international prayer call. When the host asked how I was doing, I cried. I was angry. I felt betrayed, broken, and stepped on by Russia. I told everyone I was scared for my husband and for my friends because she and her children left early to go to the United States and left her husband behind. So she was safe in the United States, but not knowing where her husband was or even if he was alive and got on this prayer call. And she said, I told everyone I was scared for my husband and for my friends in Kaviv, praying at that moment about whether they should evac evacuate. Then the host asked if someone could pray for me. And my friend Alexei, my Russian friend Alexei, came on the screen. Here's Alexei from Russia. I woke up Thursday morning startled to learn that my country had invaded Ukraine. It was a cold morning, and I watched the news in silence, and I struggled to eat my breakfast, shame that my country was starting a war against another. I felt afraid for the future of the world, and I grieved for my Ukrainian borders and my Ukrainian brothers and sisters, who would, whether they would live or die in the aftermath of their decision. He said, I was born in the Soviet Union, and I started going to church. And for me, finding faith was more than accepting that I was God's child. It was realizing that I had brothers and sisters around the world. And one of those Ukra was a Ukrainian friend, and her name was Angela. I met Angela seven years ago at a Lausanne conference in Jakarta. I'll shorten down. I joined Lusanne's prayer call, and I felt grateful to see my friend Angela on the screen. It was heartbreaking to hear she and other Ukrainians on the call and what they were going through. It felt awful that my country was causing her so much personal distress. When the facilitator asked who would volunteer to pray for her, I said yes and answered the call to her. Of all the people that God could have used to comfort me that day, he used a Russian brother to give me a glimpse of his heart. Alexei, the Russian. After I finished praying, the host asked me to share how I was feeling, and I told them I feel terrible and I'm ashamed of my country's action. I will never forget the look on my Ukrainian friend's eyes, in her eyes. Instead of condemnation, I saw compassion from the Ukrainian brothers and sisters. Angela wanted to pray for me. She asked God to show himself to those in Russia who felt powerless and afraid. She prayed for revival in Russia and Ukraine and a longing that we had both shared in our hearts for years. On that day Russia invaded our neighboring country, God used a Ukrainian sister to give me a further glimpse of his grace. The enemy wants to divide us these days, sowing hatred and separation between Ukraine and Russia. It hurts to watch some, this is Angela now from Ukraine talking, it hurts to watch some of those in Russia taking an open stand for Ukraine. Maybe some think that if they speak up, that their children or themselves will be in danger. I try not to judge, but it's still painful. Think about ourselves. Trying not to judge, but it's painful. But I believe that the most important thing for us is to remember that we are one body of Christ. We are all united by his spirit. 
Now remember, this is more fundamental churches speaking here. But remember, we are, how would unity interpret that? Remember, we are all one body in Christ. We are all one in the Christ presence, that each and every one of us has that Christ presence inside of us. So we are all united by spirit. It's of course, the miracles would say we are all united by the Holy Spirit. Russia is currently bombing my country and killing its people, but amid this pain, we stand together, we cry together, we pray together. My good friend Alexei exemplified this. Love, this is me, my closing thought after reading this. Love will overcome power and hate. Do you believe that to be true? You've got to believe it in the core of your being. Do you believe that love will overcome power and hate? Absolutely, yes. Do you believe that love is the only thing that can cast out fear? Course in Miracles says there are only two root emotions, love or fear. You cannot have your feet in both. You are either in love or you are either in fear. So I'm going to hit you a little hard here, hit myself a little hard to remind myself because it is so easy to say that I'm sending out love, I'm sending out love, but, 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 but. So where are you? You've stuck your feet into fear. Get yourself back into love. It's okay. Trust me, every single day on my vacation, I was able to read more news than I ever thought I would in my whole entire life. All because I had the time. Right? Well, what did that do? Hooked me into the fear realm. And then I have a husband who not only reads the news, but he fact checks everything. So then he needs to share with me the fact check part of it. And I go outside, I'm going to meditate. I close the door. Are you sure you don't want to hear this one? I'm like, oh, no. The feeling in the heart, I have said this, what do you want to call it, a sermon or talk, whatever this is I do on Sundays, I have said it many, many times. The feeling in the heart is the prayer. It doesn't matter where you are and it doesn't matter what words you're saying. It matters how you feel in your heart. I'm praying for peace for the world, and I'm praying for all the people in Ukraine and Russia. I can't believe that this is going on. And now where did I, my feeling go? I started with a really good feeling, praying for them. But then the images started showing up in my head and it changed my prayer to start slipping in with this fear emotion. People, this is important to start to own because this is why unity and new thought churches are game changers in this world. Because we're trying to teach ourselves to catch ourselves. Mary Morrissey would say, be the watcher of the portal of your mind. Be a watcher of the portal of your mind because as soon as you start praying for Ukraine and Russia, there are victims on both sides the images that are being shown on the news and in publications start to go there. And it starts to move that feeling in the heart. It is so important to be the watcher of the portal of your mind so when that happens, open your eyes and get that picture out, move back into prayer. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. We're being human beings, and we are also being bombarded. We are 
overwhelmed with information. Information is good. Too much information is not healthy. Are you balancing your news with the good news? It's critical that you do this. Are you balancing? Did anybody see the picture at the train station in Poland with all the baby carriages, empty baby carriages for the mothers and children getting, escaping Ukraine, coming to Poland and not have a stroller? Diapers, blankets were all waiting there. Have you seen the grandmother who carried her, I looks like a German shepherd, carried this dog 10 miles to try and get her and the dog over the borderline. Have you seen the little 10-year-old boy who walked his way to, I, w I forget where it is he walked, Sarah, what's the, it begins with an S. Slovakia. Car walked his way by himself through a little 10-year-old body with a smile on his face and asking people for directions. And he made it without one bit of problem. This is the kind of stuff I'm encouraging you to balance yourself with. As weather gets better, and it's supposed to, I tried to bring Florida weather with me, but I tried to pack it in the truck, but there was no room. But it's going to get nicer. Get outside. Get outside and connect with nature. Nature never gives up. Look at forest fires. Look at what happens at what we call devastation. And look how nature takes care of itself. So I want you to own this feeling in the heart is the prayer. Because if we get hooked, then what are we putting out to the universe? And the universe responds to energy, okay? It doesn't respond to what's coming out of Kathy's mouth. It responds to my energy. And that's why, for me, it is important to keep my energy up as often as I can because I want the universe to know that I'm playing big. I am not playing small. So with that, I'm going to give you a little bit of the talk that I had planned on, which was, let's go to the first one. Have to, right? It said, I have to, I get to, or I want to. I have to is an obligation. Get to is a privilege and a gift. Okay, let me be honest here that, let me think, come on in. Uh, I, probably five days ago, we, we got in on late Friday night. So probably Wednesday, I had to say to myself, oh, it's Wednesday because I lost track of days. It was wonderful. But I'm like, oh, I have to get a talk together. I get to have, I get to put a talk together. By yesterday morning, I said, I want to get my talk together. Do you see the change in my face? Okay. Think about what else. Oh, my gosh. Come on, somebody. Does somebody have a have to? Oh, there you go. That's the obvious one. I have to go to work. Versus, I get to go to work. How does that feel? Yeah. Okay, I have to is this, right? Pay attention to your body language. I have to. I get to. I want to. Even stretches your neck even higher. But I'm happy if we can just get to the I get to. Ron and Rhea... I got to visit them in Florida. They're snowbirds. They'll be back here in the spring, but I got to visit them. 
And Ron has shared this with us on the Monday Zoom lunch many times about the have to versus get to. And when you can change, you can catch yourself when you say, I have to get gas in the car. Now that's a biggie right now, isn't it? I have to put gas in the car. Think how blessed you are. You get to put gas in your car. I have to go to the grocery again. I forgot milk. I get to go to the grocery and get milk. Do you see how that changes? The feeling in your heart? See these little subtleties, subtle, subtle things that are all connected in this little way. So think about that. Get to is a privilege and a gift. So let's go to that next one, Kathy, please. Hey, begin your day Oh, with a I get to mentality instead of I have to thought process. I get to go to work. I get to have a busy day. Whatever it may be, we often dress our opportunities as stress. Isn't that the truth? You get up in the morning, you say, I have to go to a meeting first thing this morning. It's already done something already to your bloodstream and to your brain chemistry. Just by saying that, even if you're saying it quietly and not saying it out loud, it's the feeling, again, how important that is. When you can change getting up in the morning and say, I get, I get to engage with my kids who I wish would not engage so much in the morning. I get to have a conversation with my teenager. Instead of I have to engage in a conversation with my teenager about what he did the other night. Okay? I get to. Let's go to that last one. Talk about light and dark. See the darkness on the have to? How are you going to be a lighthouse in this world if you're speaking constantly about all the have-tos you have to do today? Oh, trust me, I've said a bunch of them. I have to go to the grocery because there's nothing in the house. No, I get to go to the grocery. Oh, my God, I have to do all this laundry. No, I get to do all this laundry. I have water accessible to me. I have a washing machine that when I turn it on, it actually runs. How blessed we are. Oh, I don't even know how to close this talk. I don't think, I think I'm done. <laughs> I, I think I'm done for now. I'm going to go through announcements in just a minute, but I do want to tell you also something that Michael and, and he has taught me, and you, I've shared it many times about in traffic, right? Okay. We're, traffic is crazy. Uh, very angry drivers out there. Would you not agree? Seem to be more than before. I don't know what, what it is, but a lot of angry drivers, a lot of zip, cutting in and out. Uh, and I, I can't tell you the number of times. Namaste. Welcome to my lane. <laughs> Namaste. Welcome to my lane. Changes everything. Changes everything. We didn't blow the horn once at anybody. So consider that this week. Namaste. That the Christ's presence, that lighthouse in me, truly sees that lighthouse in each and every one of you. Namaste.